Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we are delighted and honored to have with us Connie Zweig, who has written a new book in addition to her very well-known work on shadow. And the new book uh, is The Inner Work of Age, Shifting from Role to Soul. Uh, And as I just said to Connie, I have devoured this book. There are teeth marks on some of the pages. Uh, And it is um, in my collection of books on aging wisely and well. uh, This is the one that has gone right straight to my heart with all kinds of things to discuss, questions to ask, and a time for us to really explore this. So with that said, we may as well just dive in. Thank you, Deb. So, Connie, I'm curious to begin about how this book idea progressed from your own experience, from your own experience of aging and your own experience of analytical psychology. What's the narrative there? Yes, I'm happy to explore that with you. As I entered my 60s and began to contemplate retirement from clinical work, I noticed that I started to feel disoriented. And it was really surprising to me because I had done so much psychological and spiritual practice. I really didn't anticipate that. And yet that's what was happening. And so I began to, um, you know, as an intuitive thinker, I can say that to this community, I began to read and research conscious aging, positive aging, Um, depth psychology and aging. And it was very difficult to find any material that was really satisfying for me. There was um, one collection called Young and Aging that was from a conference many years ago that's excellent. But I couldn't really find people writing on this and teaching on this. So then I discovered Saging International, which is a community that stems from the work of Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi and his book, From Aging to Saging. And I went through their one-year initiation process to become an elder. And it was very beautiful, but it had no unconscious, nothing about shadow, nothing about how to orient to the unconscious. And for me, that's where it's all happening, right? I mean, that's where the deepest fears and dreads, images and projections are all lying dormant in the unconscious. So there was a moment where I had the thought, oh my God, I have to write another book. (laughs) And I, I said to my husband, meeting the shadows of age. And he went, oh my God. (laughs) 
So slowly I began to explore and meditate about it. And then I started teaching workshops based on the saging um, training. And that gave me contact with hundreds of people who were in late life and also experiencing disorientation and looking for guidance. I mean, someone said to me, we're aging without a map. I don't have a GPS. There were all these comments about, you know, the lack of guidance. And I realized it was a lack of guidance to become an elder. We all become seniors in this society at 65 when we have a Medicare birthday, but we don't become elders. At least from my point of view, that's not an elder, developmentally speaking. And so we don't have that map. And as I interviewed more and more people, I started to see the shadows, the unconscious inner obstacles that were keeping people from aging consciously and with full awareness and with a connection to the possibilities for this time of life. We were all missing out because we didn't have guidance, we weren't connected to the psyche, we didn't know the spiritual possibilities, and then the writing began. And as I opened the book with chapter one, it really began with a dream. And then the whole thing kind of unfolded from there. I saw the shadows of age, and as I sort of identified those, then I was able to see the developmental tasks that were necessary to break through each of those shadows and really become an elder in a conscious way. I'm wondering what your biggest obstacle was personally to transition from elderly to elder. Okay. Yes, I don't use that word elderly (laughs) um, because it's so charged and full of projection, you know. Yes. Well, the first obstacle I identified, Joseph, was my own inner ageist. And it was really deeply unconscious because I had spent the late 60s and the 70s fighting all of the isms in the culture, right? Fighting racism. I was at Berkeley fighting racism, fighting sexism, fighting homophobia. And in those days, nobody was talking about ageism. So I was not aware that I had internalized from the collective shadow all these negative attitudes about age, about the archetype of age, and about the process of aging. Things like young is good and old is bad. Independent is good and dependent is bad. Um, healthy is good and sick is bad, you know, strong is good and weak is bad. And so what happens, as you know, with the development of the ego and shadow together, is that what the collective deems good gets included into our egos or our conscious personalities, what we identify with. And what is deemed negative in relation to the ego gets banished into the unconscious. So we don't want to be weak or dependent or old. I had an experience of sitting in a restaurant and an older woman came in and sat next to me. And she looked very, um, she was dirty. Her hands were dirty. She looked very poor, her clothes were tattered, and she ordered free samples of food. Because I'm so attuned to my self-talk, my inner dialogue, from doing shadow work for so long, I started to notice what I was saying to myself almost immediately. She doesn't belong here in my favorite vegan restaurant. She's probably homeless. I'm never going to be like that. I'm never going to be old and poor and ordering free samples. And as soon as that dialogue came up, I was totally shocked Mm. at myself. And, And I felt ashamed that I was being so judgmental or that there was a part of me 
right? What I would call a shadow character being so judgmental. And that led me on a whole journey. You know, as these shadow characters will do when you start to make a conscious relationship with them, right? They can take you on a whole trip. As a result of this, some research by psychologist Becca Levy out of Yale University. And she has spent her whole career studying unconscious, what she calls embodied stereotypes, but they're shadow characters. They're unconscious images, fantasies, beliefs about age. And she has studied them over many, many decades and she's found how they affect our brains, even our memories, our cardiac health, our emotional health, um, our mental health like depression, um, even our longevity. Hmm. And that's what made me realize that this inner ageist is a primary shadow character that's affecting, shaping, I would say, forming our own experience of age, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. The way that we've internalized ageism is deeply shaping our own experience of aging. And so that woke me up to my inner ageist. And I began to work with it. And I began to have a different experience of older adults. Older adults on the street, older adults in my family, older adults among my friends at that point. I was in my late 60s and had some friends in my 80s, so in their 80s. So that was a big inner obstacle for me, Joseph, that, um, I mean, I couldn't have written the book if I hadn't really broken free of the inner ageist. Yeah, you had to learn to welcome your inner, old, poor, dirty. The bag lady shadow. Mm -hmm. Yes, the bag lady. Which many people in our culture carry because we're surrounded by homeless people now. We see them all the time when we go out on the street and it generates a a deep fear in everyone of being poor and without housing and alone. That's uh, really, uh, you know, somehow such a deeply affecting image of all the things, especially in our culture, that we don't want to be poor and alone rejected, unseen, invisible. And uh, you write about the invisibility around becoming an older person. And when we were talking uh, prior to recording, you know, I do not feel at all invisible, but I am aware of what is projected on me Uh, Now that I am most certainly an elder, or as I prefer to refer to myself, a crone, because I like the sassy uh, (laughs) kind of undertone that it has. Uh, But I uh, am aware that people see gray hair. They open doors for me. They offer to, do I need help out to the car with my groceries? And I appreciate, truly I do, uh, the kindness in that. And yet there is a relationship uh, to being seen in a particular way, first of all, as old, older, rather than just as a person. And there's some way that all of this uh, tends to sort of erase our personhood, uh, at least in casual everyday encounters. And sometimes, as with the woman you sat near in the restaurant, And I think that is a huge part of the shadow of of aging, is that that's our identity is old rather than wise, interesting, funky, and a hundred other things. Yes. So let's talk about projection for a minute, (laughs) right? Because the inner ageist is projecting onto others right? That they are all those negative things you just mentioned. But the target of the projection who receives that ends up feeling in that box 
put into this tiny box mm -hmm. of old person, mm -hmm. helpless person, needy person, geezer, bad driver. <laughs> and so there's this feedback, I think, yes. between individuals projecting and then the collective carrying that projection and then it coming back. And there's this like stereo effect whenever there's an unconscious bias like that. And what interests me is that we've seen recently how legislation has not been able to eliminate racism. We've seen that, you know, social justice movements that work from the outside in have only been able to go so far. And people who carry that projection, people of color who carry that projection, have serious health consequences have economic consequences, have all kinds of, um, I mean, this is not a simple matter. This is a very complex issue to carry that, that bias of other people against you. And so I want to suggest that the same thing is true of ageism. We can't legislate it away. It really requires inner work on our own internal bag lady and bag man, our own internal ageist, our own projections. I gave a presentation with Ashton Applewhite, who's the sort of, who's kind of carrying the anti-ageism movement in our country in a lot of ways. And we talked about ageism from the outside in and ageism from the inside out. And there are limitations to both. I mean, we also need a social justice movement against ageism, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they're both really necessary, just as we need legislation against racism. But each one alone is not sufficient. And so the situation is very complicated around ageism. And one of the biggest fears of the hundreds of people I interviewed is becoming invisible, is becoming irrelevant, is becoming useless, no longer able to be seen. And, you know, I can say to you all, because of your clinical background, the invisibility triggers the narcissistic injury. Mm -hmm. So if there's an early narcissistic wound of being unseen, that's really going to be exacerbated in later life, if that hasn't been worked through. And I think that's an important clinical, I don't know about you, but I didn't get any clinical training to work with older adults. So, you know, part of what I'm trying to do with the book is make it available to clinicians who work with older adults. And I think this issue of the narcissistic wound and the invisibility is really important. So how can we find ways for people to be seen, to be recognized, to be valued in this stage of life? You're talking about projection, and it seems to me that something that we all need at all stages in life is that experience of feeling really, truly seen, and how powerful that is, and how ideally that's something that we offer to our, our clients. And Deb, I'm really appreciating what you said, that when you become, when you're seen as old, it's, it's suddenly like you can't be really seen because you're sort of seen as old first and, you, and you're carrying all of these projections. I'm recalling a, a time a few years ago when uh, my, my mother was injured and my dad and I took her to the hospital. And uh, the hospital staff, the nurses and the doctors, my mom really wasn't able to engage. So my, my father was sort of uh, interacting with them. And very smart, accomplished person with 100% of his faculties. And they were talking to him, you know, in, in this way, I was really angry. I was really angry at how they were talking to him. I could really see this process that you've both been talking about, that they saw a different person than was actually in front of them. And, on, and I shared with my dad later, my upset about it. And, you know, he had this real kind of equanimity about it. He's like, well, you know, that's just, that's just the way it is. He, he, he knew it was happening, <laughs> but he, he didn't get activated by it, which I thought was really to his, really so much to his credit that he just needed to communicate what he needed to communicate. And, 
you know, get, make sure my mom got the care she needed, you know, but, but how painful to be misapprehended all the time. Yeah. And condescended, patronized. Exactly. That's right. When you have a lifetime of experience. You know, I, I have to say, you know, maybe for your father, uh, Lisa, and, and to some extent in very mild ways, my own experience it doesn't matter so much if I know who I am. And the underlying motivation is a, basically a kind of a, a kindness that may be uninformed, uh, it may be infused with all these unconscious ageist stereotypes. It is much offset uh, by my encounters with with people uh, that have more depth, more integrity, more meaning, more relational zest, etc., where the other side of this shadow also gets projected, uh, which is wisdom. Uh, and naturally, I'm much happier to receive that projection. <laughs> <laughs> but that too is is or can be there. Um, and I will add to this that one of the things I have been most fortunate in and didn't realize as much as I do after reading your book, Connie, is what fantastic models for being old I had. Mm. Oh, boy, did I ever have a whole lot of of loving, present, zesty, no-nonsense live your life, older people, especially people who are entitled, as I now am um, moving right ahead on this, <laughs> um, to say it like it is. Uh, you know, that's just BS. That's not true. Let's expand this into, because I think what we're talking about is identity. We're talking about when we're the target of a projection that's narrow, whether it's old or black, or Jewish, or Republican, or whatever it is, part of a tribe that's other than us, mm -hmm. then we're, we're looked at as that's all we are, right? That's all, and that's what we're saying right now, that, that the doctor looked at your father, Lisa, as an old man and couldn't see anything else. That's all he saw was old. And part of what's happening in the culture right now is people are taking on very narrow identities from my point of view. You know, I am trans or I am Native American or I am whatever it is. And I'm struggling with this in the same way that I would struggle with I'm old and I'm proud. Because, and I understand that kind of developmentally, we need to accept these ethnic identities or sexual identities, gender identities. I get that because they've been rejected and they need to be reclaimed. But I also want to say that's not all of who we are. You know, we are spiritual beings. And whether we call that soul or spirit or higher self or the self as Jung did or whatever we call that, it doesn't really matter to me. The God within, Buddha nature, I don't care what the names, but there's something larger than these kind of narrow identities that people are taking on now. And I think that's really important. And I want to just kind of so I want to make the point that I'm not saying, I'm not, re first of all, I'm not reversing the value and saying old is good and young is bad, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. right? Because that's ageist. Right, yep. Right? But I'm also not, I also don't want to advocate for, you know, I'm old and that's all I am. I have 72 years of life experience and I'm so much deeper and more complicated and more, have access to so much more than that. And I think one of the great benefits of being older 
is a sense of n- knowing who one is, of, uh, you know, a finally really kind of growing up and growing into a sense of self. And that's a hopeful kind of destination, if you will, of at least 60s, 70s, and beyond, which is certainly what your father has in his late 80s, Lisa. Of uh, that sense of self is very hard won, hard earned, and uh, really is very much a compensation for how other people may see him or me or any of us. And I- I'm connecting this and moving into your idea, Connie, which I just loved of uh, having a cultural revolution led by older people, led by elders. And you compared it to the youth revolution of the 60s, of all the stuff about civil rights and Vietnam War protests, which I well remember. (laughs) But that this might be a time for older people with some life experience and hopefully some wisdom, some breadth and some depth to make an impact. There's a lot that can be offered after having lived six, seven, eight, nine decades. And that's related to invisibility, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So how do we, in the baby boom generation or even the silent generation, find our voice now? How do we find a way to contribute now that's meaningful, that's during the pandemic? And many people are finding their passions. What is this, you know, what is the cause? If we're talking about activism, what is the cause that is calling to you? What is the service that only you can do? Elders Action Network is has many groups organized around social justice issues and climate. Um, this new elder climate group just came on online um, with Jane Fonda and Bill McKibben um, called Third Act, and they're focused solely on elders and climate change. There's lots of stuff going on right now. And, you know, in our language, that's really comfortable for people who are very extroverted and people who are more introverted can find other ways to serve maybe in their own families, with their grandkids, maybe with their creativity, exploring creativity, which is such a wonderful uh, thing to do in this stage of life. So these are ways that we can give to the common good and refuse that invisibility that's projected onto us. I was thinking about the topic of invisibility and how that can trigger the narcissistic injury of being unseen as a child. And I was reflecting on a very different experience with my father, who's deceased now. That in the last maybe 10 years of his life, his personality went through a a rather radical change, and, and this is before the cognitive deterioration, where he progressively lost the ability to listen And uh, all he wanted to do was talk Mm. all the time so that any time you were around him, there was just no other oxygen in the room. Mm. That he just needed every opinion, every thought, every consideration to constantly, in an unfiltered way, be uh, demonstrated and acted out in the environment, which sadly isolated him because it made it very difficult to be around him. And so the larger family and his friends started to withdraw. But I hadn't thought about it from the lens that you had offered, that this was the repeat of a difficult childhood, which he really did have, raised in abject poverty in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in the 30s, um, struggling just to create a life. But it was such a remarkable change because the father of my childhood actually was uh, very skilled communicator. He was a salesman, a designer. He had a very different personality, so it was hard for me to even recognize him in those last 10 years. And I wish that I'd had that frame. I think that would have Mm -hmm. helped me. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there was the resurgence of these unmet needs. Mm -hmm. But I think we're also veering into uh, something that goes under the heading of diminishment, of your mother's diminishment, Lisa, and Joseph, your father's diminishment. And, and that, too, is part of old age. We hope not, or we hope it comes very late in life, but that we do lose some of our faculties for being present, for physical health, uh, all, all manner of things. And, and Connie, one of the things I appreciated about your book was the, the way you, you dealt with that. I, I appreciated, and this, it seems to me, relates also to what you were saying about identity a little while ago, that there's something about not collapsing into a, a rigid place where one thing just becomes its opposite or where we sort of sugarcoat things. But this really important work of just accepting what is. I really appreciate you talked about some clinical work with a woman who accused you of being ageist because you were just trying to encourage her, invite her to accept the reality of her situation. You know, that there, there is diminishment, there, there is limitation, there is loss that that's just is how it is. And, and we have some, some choice about that. You know, there are things that we can do to safeguard our health or our independence. That's not unlimited. And at some point, the job does become to just orient to reality. Yeah. And to hold those opposites. Yes. That there's great beauty and potential in this time of life. And there's also grief and loss and, you know, loss of people, loss of abilities, more limitations. And somehow holding those opposites allows us to be in a deeper truth with what is, to be more present and I think, you know, for those of us who've done a lot of psychological work, we do have, I think, a better shot at not regressing so much emotionally. You know, I just held a memorial for Robert Bly, mm. who passed away. And, you know, he had dementia for 14 years. And it made me remember Marion Woodman, who had dementia. And I thought to myself, it's not about our creativity. It's not about our cognitive capacity. It's not about how much we've used our brain's plasticity over life. We just don't know. It's not going to happen to everyone. Many people remain very lucid, but we just don't know if it's going to happen to yeah, us. It's really out of our control. It's out of our control. And it's a kind of uncertainty that we live with. And so I want to acknowledge, as you said, Lisa, the opposites, both sides here. And I think that the, the old way of looking at aging was a decline narrative. Everything was downhill and it focused on the diminishments. And now we have this longevity that we've never, ever had before. And there are people whose health span is, is up to their lifespan, you know, in their 80s or 90s and thriving. And we just don't know as individuals what our own fate will be in this matter. Yeah. Connie, if I could introduce a bit of a pivot and moving into a pragmatic attitude, how would you guide somebody who's listening to us to identify and work with their inner bag lady. Because so much of this whole making has to do with finding these shadow figures and developing a relationship. But if somebody was new to this, how would you coach them into that? So the method of shadow work um, can be stated fairly simply, but it's not simple because, you know, the shadow's nature is to hide right? It's, na it's tricky, it's elusive, and so its nature is to um, go back into the unconscious as soon as we identify with it. The first step is what I described when I was sitting near this 
woman and I noticed what I was saying to myself. So what is the self-talk, the inner dialogue that's going on with you in any kind of situation <clears throat> about aging? If you're noticing that, you know, you're with an older person and you begin to talk to yourself and it's kind of activated, or if you notice that um, someone you love is showing signs of aging, what are you saying to yourself? And the second step is, what are the feelings that arise with those thoughts? What kind of emotions are coming up? And what are the bodily sensations that go with it? You know, for people who are more sensate, they might notice their bodily sensations first. It doesn't show up for me that way, but there are people who will notice their bodily sensations first. Or feeling types might notice their feelings first. So you identify those three dimensions. Okay, mental, emotional, physical dimensions. And then you have three cues that a shadow figure from the unconscious is starting to emerge into consciousness. And so as you notice that pattern, you can then see if there's an image that goes with it. What does it look like inside? And give it a name. And once you name it, like the inner ageist or the bag lady, <laughs> um, then you have a character, a shadow figure, that was previously unconscious, that's now in your awareness. So now I can work with the bag lady that was outside of my awareness before, that I was projecting unconsciously, but now I'm aware of it as a figure in my own psyche. And there are many ways to do this. You know, people have different um, styles. Some people like to draw it. Some people want to dialogue with it. So you can talk to it when it comes up and you can listen to it when it comes up and begin a dialogue. Because these shadow characters form to meet a need early in our lives. They form as protectors and they're protecting us from something in our childhood and then as we grow up and become adults, they sabotage us. So what was for at first protecting us is now sabotaging us. So we could say, you know, um, I had a very difficult grandmother who was quite cruel. And it was, I think, part of the way that I internalized ageism. And that part was protecting me. I'm not going to be like her. And then as I became an adult and my own aging was happening, it sabotaged me from actually becoming conscious and accepting, as Lisa said, of what is, mm -hmm. right? So I began to work with that character and I saw that it had been protecting me and then it was sabotaging me. Well, what's it sabotaging me from? Something that I really value and want to experience wholeheartedly, you know, consciously. So those are some ways of working with it. Some of my clients used to write letters to the shadow character and then from the shadow character. <laughs> and so it's really like an active imagination. It's like an act, exactly. So you can work with it in many ways. And then you'll start to notice that the charge, because, this, because it was so unconscious, it carries a lot of charge. And it will recede again, right, into the unconscious. And as it comes forward and you work with it and it recedes again and, and you remember and you forget and you remember and you forget, it starts to lose its charge. It's not such a big trigger after a while because it's more familiar to your ego consciousness. And it starts to change and your relationship to it changes. I think that's uh, really just so uh, important that resolving the polarity between the protector and what then becomes a saboteur. Mm -hmm. 
is simply, although it takes such a lot, it's simply relationship. When we know something, when we know an inner figure and can dialogue with it in any of the ways you mentioned, and there are so many more, uh, it's not so fearsome. We like what we know, and uh, we have to get to know those parts of ourselves. And it may show up in a dream. Oh, yes. And so we can work with it in that way, and we can work with it more consciously like a dream figure in the way if you're familiar with working with dreams. You can work with it like that. You know, this figure is a part of me. What is it trying to tell me? What is it standing for? What does it mean? What is its deeper message? What is its deeper value? So one of the important pieces is rallying our courage and determination to really reach inside of ourselves to these uncomfortable places and to develop a relationship with those elements and to go where that leads us, which is a different kind of journey and in many ways an internal journey. That's so right. You know, this just seems to me almost like um, Jungian individuation work 101, about which Jung wrote 18 volumes. Um, So uh, obviously it's a little more complicated than that. And many, many wisdom traditions, psychological uh, theories, et cetera. So it's one of those all roads lead to Rome kind of things. But that if we do rally, as you said, Joseph, our courage and determination to know those parts of ourselves, it's pretty enriching. Yeah. Let me also say, to tie it back to our conversation about identity, It's important that we don't identify with the shadow character because that is not who we are, right? Narrow box. So I am not the inner ageist. It's a part in me that I internalized from the outside. And it's a part that I'm aware of now and have a relationship with, but it's not who I am. And that's true for any shadow figure that we identify as we do this work. You, you know, talking about individuation and, and kind of where shadow work can take us, it leads me to this other idea that you brought up in the book so beautifully, and that's this notion of life completion. And I, I love that term. And Connie, can you say a little bit more about your conception of that? You know, the subtitle of the book, Shifting from Role to Soul, is about this spiritual shift in identity. Jung called ego to self, you know, Edinger called it the shift in the ego self axis. Role to soul came from Ramdas. And it just stayed with me for so many decades that I thought, you know, I should use it because it's so intuitively recognizable to people. And they know that they're giving up their roles. But then what? then who am I, right? And so as we contemplate the completion of our lives, on a certain level, we're contemplating the completion of the ego story, the story of our roles, our roles at work, our roles in family, our roles in creatively in terms of contribution, what we were talking about when we get much older. So then this perennial question comes up, who am I? And that's, I think, where spiritual work comes in or spiritual practice, contemplative practice, and really exploring how we cultivate a spiritual identity, an identification with the self or the transpersonal center or soul, whatever we call it. And so then what does life completion mean? And so I think there's that double meaning of how do we complete our stories, our ego stories, and how do we move to this deeper spiritual identity and allow our lives, our, our body's lives to be completed? Some people believe that there is a life after death and some people don't. And I'm not, the book is not about beliefs, 
It's not about metaphysics. It doesn't depend on what you believe. And so, you know, for me, what came up around life completion was, and I asked this question of many people, and they all had different answers. And it was about this fantasy of the promised land. And for some people, that fantasy is seeing their grandchildren grow up on a sustainable planet. And for some people, that fantasy is um, seeing a, a big piece of work completed, you know, their magnum opus. For some people, it's about relationship reconciling an unhealed relationship so that they can really die without regret. And that would, that came up a lot for people. How, what do I need to say or do in order to die without regret? That would be my promised land. For some people, there is a more spiritual attainment in mind. How do I attain a certain level of development or stage of awareness or level of consciousness um, if I've been doing spiritual practices for a long time. And that's the promised land. And so life completion kind of takes place in that context. But I would say to, for most people, that there is an emotional level of emotional thread for life completion and relationships, and giving and receiving love and forgiveness. And for some people, there's a creativity aspect of life completion that's important, and for some, or work, work or creativity. And for some people, I'd say the spiritual story is important. I wrote about the story of Moses not entering the promised land, and how we fantasize about that well-known tale. You know, did he die fulfilled? Did he die angry? Was, you know, God's kiss at the end, his entrance to the promised land that was not about Canaan, that was about, you know, kind of um, joining with God. So, that's kind of a, an interesting story to work with like a dream, to do active imagination with that story and see what comes up for you and what it tells you about what is a fulfilled life for you. You know, what that brings up, well, it brings up so many things for me, but in particular, the Moses story makes me think of um, the death of Leo Tolstoy. And I'm probably going to get some of the details wrong, so forgive me in advance. But um, he, toward the end of his life, well, for a lot of his life, really engaged these issues of spirituality. And he freed the serfs on his estate. And and for a long time, he wanted to kind of leave his uh, aristocratic lifestyle and go and basically be a mendicant. And he finally, it was it was a very difficult thing to do. I mean, he was he was a wealthy aristocrat. And finally, at the end of the and he was quite old. I think he was, I think he may have been 90. He finally did it. He just <laughs> left. And he got as far as some train station and then he died. And it's sort of the same question. It's like, well, was it, was it like, wow, he finally did what he'd wanted to do and then he could sort of die in peace? Or was it like this bitter irony? Like he was finally going to do this thing, but then he died before he got a chance to really do it. The, the other thing I love about this idea of life completion is it really fits in well with something that we talk about a lot on the podcast, which is a sense of telos, this very Jungian idea that somehow there's some unfolding that is meant to happen, that we come into life almost with a blueprint. And part of the way I understand individuation is how much of that blueprint do we get to live out? And so the sense of life completion is something about, for me, the Jim Hollis question. What is it that wants to come into the world through you? And did it have its chance to come into the world through you? Did it, did it mostly get here? Are you pretty satisfied that you got it out as much as you could reasonably? And that if you can be in that place toward the end of life, that that's a really good place to be. 
So metaphorically, a question of motherhood, Lisa, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So for me, one of the uh, many practices in the book is life review, including life review of the unlived life. So I was able to explore that and add that to the traditional life review because, you know, me, I'm always adding the shadow dimension to everything. So in that, when I did my own life review several years ago, what I saw was that the four careers I've lived that looked so distinct to me actually had the same telos, the same soul's mission. And that mission was to transmit information about consciousness. And when I was a meditation teacher, a journalist, and a book editor, publisher, and a clinician, and a writer, I was always transmitting information about consciousness, whether I knew it or not. And so there is this sense, when you do the practices in the book and and you move toward late life, you can get this sense of the thread in the tapestry of your life that you've been following, even unknowingly. And I think that's really important feeling sense to have as you move toward life completion. I'd like to return to the idea of life completion again, and particularly pick up a thread that you'd mentioned around forgiveness. And in your book, there seemed to be a polarity between regret and forgiveness. And I think that it's a word that's ubiquitous. We toss it around all the time. But I think it's actually a very complicated psychological (laughs) process, both to receive forgiveness as well as to grant forgiveness. I'm wondering what your thoughts are and insights are around moving into a state of forgiveness. Yes, I agree with you. It's a really complex, it's not a simple I'm sorry. It's a very complex system between people. And I think part of what isn't recognized about it is that there's a power dynamic in it. So when we are asked to forgive, we have the power. And when we are asked to be forgiven, when we ask to be forgiven, we're in a different position in relation to. So I don't know if I would say regret and forgiveness are opposite. I I don't think I would say that. Mm -hmm. I would say that there's a concern when we withhold forgiveness or we need to be forgiven and it doesn't unfold in a way that deeply kind of satisfies the soul, then there may be regret. And that's really significant near the end of life. I mean, it's always significant, but near the end of life, where we recognize that, you know, the time horizon is shortening and we're losing the opportunity for that exchange. So what is needed to give and receive forgiveness? You know, there have been volumes written on this. And there are many different points of view about it. And I think some of it, some of our framework on it is structured in our level of development, level of understanding, stage of understanding things. So what is needed? Let me see if I can come up with something. Um, I feel um, that I was not as available to my mother in her later life as I wish I had been. And I feel regret about that. And my mother has been dead since 2007. So there's nothing I can do about it actively in the relationship. And I really only recognized that I felt that way after she was gone because When she was here, well, there was just, there was so much going on. And I didn't recognize that I was psychically and emotionally not present to her in the way that I wish I had been. So many people are in the situation where they can't go to the person now. Either the person won't speak to them or the person has died. 
and they can't do it in a way that, okay, let's sit down and try to work this out. They can't do that, right? So after my mother passed away, I began to write her a series of letters. And I began to um, say things that I had never said to her that I wished I had said that weren't really allowed in the space of our relationship. My mother was actually quite a conscious person in some ways. She had done a lot of psychoanalysis, but she was very trapped and limited in her in the options of her life. So I didn't want to be anything like her. And I individuated in a way that was um, kind of a jarring separation for her. And I began to apologize for that. And I began to take responsibility for it instead of blaming her for who she was. And I began to kind of look at how my life unfolded in reaction to her, in relation to her. And eventually, I settled into a different place in relation to my ancestor, because that's who she had become. And it also could be if I needed if I needed something from her, I could have done that process as well, rather than I felt like she needed this from me. I felt like I was giving mostly in this process, but it was an exchange. There was an exchange that happened there at a kind of a psychic level. So again, like that is an active imagination practice. It helped me a lot. I would say it's a different process if the person is alive and open to processing with you. Sometimes you might want to ask for a third person to be present. I've done that with clients and kind of helped them through the hurt, the disappointment, the resentment, so that both people could see the full point of view of the other person and, you know, how the wound happened and what each person needed to let it go. As you were talking, I found myself thinking about a process that I went through with my dad, that we were raised in a very tumultuous home. My parents had split up long after we'd all left home. But I sat down with my dad and I said, I need to understand what was going on in the adult world as these various things were happening in the childhood, because I only had my child story about it. And to his great credit, He said, absolutely, you can ask me anything. And so we spent a couple of hours just going through these various things that I was holding a lot of energy around and just adding these whole other layers dispersed this tension that I had about the events, but also towards him. And at the end, I I experienced it as remarkably healing. At the time, I wouldn't have said it was about forgiveness, but now I would say that in as much as the relationship was able to return without the burden of those stories, because the narratives had changed. Sadly, when I went to my mother and asked for a similar experience, she refused. Mm. And now that both of them are deceased, I'm left with this interesting comparison. Mm. And how generous it actually was of my father to be willing to go through these painful stories and stay honest with me. Mm, Yeah. You might be able to imagine what your mother's experience was in the context of having your father's story, you know, just knowing her. Mm -hmm. You might be able to imagine that. But what is so very heartening here is that forgiveness resolution is possible with the other person or Uh, in the kind of act of imagination that you described so well, uh, that there is a kind of psychic exchange uh, that's available, that is possible. And we don't want to set up, you know, the illusion that there's a perfect closure to a life, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Right? Because life is so complicated, right? But we can work toward some levels of completion 
And I think that affects the quality of our dying process. Yes. And that seems to me to be the story uh, in heading up the chapter of the promised land mm-hmm. and Moses is that it's not going to be perfect, right. but we can kind of head our canoes in the right direction and, and do the best we can. And I appreciated that throughout the book, Connie, that you're you're so clear that this is complicated and it's not going to be perfect and it's not going to be tidy. And you <laughs> you talk about aging is not one dimensional. It's full of opposites. And you list all these opposites. And what that brought up for me is um, one of my favorite passages in all of Jung. And so if you don't mind, I'd like to read it. So it's from the very end of Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. He writes, so he he was very much at the end of his life when he wrote this. I forget exactly how close, but it was a year or two or maybe even less. Um, he writes, I am satisfied with the course my life has taken. It has been bountiful and has given me a great deal. How could I ever have expected so much? Nothing but unexpected things kept happening to me. Much might have been different if I myself had been different, but it was as it had to be, for all came about because I am as I am. Many things worked out as I planned them to, but that did not always prove of benefit to me, but almost everything developed naturally and by destiny. I regret many follies which sprang from my obstinacy, but without that trait, I would not have reached my goal. And so, I am disappointed and not disappointed. I am disappointed with people and disappointed with myself. I have learned amazing things from people and have accomplished more than I expected of myself. I cannot form any final judgment because the phenomenon of life and the phenomenon of man are too vast. The older I have become, the less I have understood or had insight into or known about myself. I am astonished, disappointed, pleased with myself. I am distressed, depressed, rapturous. I am all of these things at once and cannot add up the sum. I am incapable of determining ultimate worth or worthlessness. I have no judgment about myself in my life. There is nothing I am quite sure about. I have no definite convictions, not about anything really. I know only that I was born and exist, and it seems to me that I have been carried along. I exist on the foundation of something I do not know. In spite of all uncertainties, I feel a solidity underlying all existence and a continuity in my mode of being. You've been listening to This Jungian Life, From our website, thisunionlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this union life.